<laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? I offer you the contract to deliver him to me alive. Where do I find him? He's to be moved across the border and taken to an army barracks at Zimbala. And you want me to intercept him and deliver him to you? Correct. Julius Limbani is alive. I don't care. Yes, you do. I'm finished with all of that. I'm getting too old, by the way, so are you. A merchant banker fronting a multinational hires a former British Army officer turned mercenary to overthrow the corrupt dictator of a Central African country by rescuing a populist leader who was unfairly removed as president. Can these old dogs of war return the rightful leader to his people, or is it a suicide mission doomed to fail? Although South London's Andrew McLaughlin was considered a journeyman director and was criticised by some for bringing a western shoot 'em up style to the film, I believe he struck the right balance of sticking to the source material but also making an extremely entertaining action movie. The film was based on Daniel Carney's critically acclaimed book The Thin White Line. Carney was born in Beirut in 1944, the son of a British diplomat. In 63, he settled in what was then southern Rhodesia, soon to be renamed Zimbabwe, and joined the British South African Police, where he served for three years. South London's Roy Budd has an impressive list of film scores, but Budd unfortunately died of a brain hemorrhage at the age of just 46. The film was sold on bringing together the three larger-than-life leading men of Moore, Harris and Burton. Burton is very much the lead and gives his typical charismatic, brooding and intense performance. The shoot turned out to be incredibly difficult for the 51-year-old Burton, as he was already in very poor health, making the more physical scenes very difficult. In fact, a few years later, he was hospitalised with liver and kidney problems. Doctors discovered that his entire spinal column was found to be coated in crystallised alcohol. Harris, like Burton, was well known for his hell-raising antics on movie sets with his excessive drinking. As an insurance policy, the producer made the Irishman deposit half his salary, but then he costs of bad behaviour subtracted, and his final paycheck would not be delivered until after the movie was completed. Harris amazingly remained dry for the movie's duration. Roger Moore makes up the trio and was understandably a little in awe of his co-stars and actually requested to have fewer lines in the scenes that he shared with Burton and Harris. This kind of request was almost unheard of from a major star. He later said, You didn't seriously expect me to act against those guys. Moore, another South Londoner, unlike his Welsh and Irish co-stars, was the only one with military experience. He was a second lieutenant in the British Army. There was a lot of real-world experience behind the scenes on this movie, which gives the film far more authenticity than many movies to date. None more so than the technical and military advisor, a former real-life mercenary, Colonel Mad Mike Hoar, who led a band of European ex-servicemen in mercenary campaigns in Belgium's Congo in the 60s and 70s. He was brought in as a military advisor to add realism to the combat sequences. In fact, the title of the film came from Mad Mike's mercenary unit, emblem of the wild geese, which he adopted from the 17th century Irish army unit, who were on the losing side of the glorious revolution of 1688. They became soldiers of fortune after their defeat. After an agreement with the king that forced the unit to leave the British Isles, they saw a flight of wild geese heading south for the winter as they departed and adopted them as their emblem. The authenticity was also reflected in the actors, with some of them having military experience and had been in real warfare. Most notably were Jack Watson, who played Sergeant Major Sandy, who served as a physical training instructor in the Royal Navy during World War II. Percy Herbert, who played Keith, was a World War II veteran. He was wounded in the defense of Singapore and captured by the Imperial Japanese Army and interned in a POW camp. Most amazingly of all was Hardy Kruger, who played Peter Kurtz was drafted into the German army in late 44. He saw action against US forces in the 38th SS Division. He was captured by US troops. This film is far away from where Hollywood is today. There's so many reasons to cancel it by today's standards. This film would be considered so problematic, it's hard to know where to begin. It is the very essence of patriarchy with old white dudes as heroes. Its leading men would be criticised as white saviours. There's racism, misogyny, homophobia, 
forget microaggressions, the film is toxic masculinity turned up to 11. I mean, even the N-word is used. Even the bad guys are a no-no for Hollywood today. Predominantly African-American, or in this case just African, there are even some socialist communists from the former East Germany and Cuba. Sean Penn would be outraged. And despite all this, the film is more accepting and inclusive than the recent round of god-awful Marvel movies, with more positive takes on acceptance of others and a realistic rejection of racism. As for being homophobic, in this film the openly gay medic is just one of the guys. You could even argue that he gets the most heroic death in the film. In fact, the baddies aren't as politically incorrect as first meets the eye. Screen legend Stuart Granger plays the head bad guy, although merchant bankers with their claws in underdeveloped countries are still as insidious today as they were then. If you remade this film today, it would make more sense for the bad guy to be a CEO of Nike, who didn't care about the products being made by child labour or a Disney executive type that turned a blind eye to Uyghurs in concentration camps in China. Although the men in this film at first glance seem old and out of shape, there's an underlying toughness that is sadly lacking in the heroes of modern movies. Western society seems hell-bent on throwing old white guys on the scrap heap of time, but write them off at your peril, because there may still be life in these old dogs yet. Alpha males who love to fight for a good cause, or simply for money. The manliness of this film is off the charts. It must be a five on the manly meter. I just like to fight, with weapons or without.